So today we're going to start with an introduction to basic photography. So first class was a purely an introduction to the course. Second one was kind of my overview of how do we deal with files, organization, et cetera. Uh, and today we're actually starting with real content for the class. And that's going to start with an introduction to photography. Now, there are, of course, classes that focus just on photography for the whole semester. There are classes that focus just on Photoshop for the whole semester. It's my job in this class to give you a taste of a lot of different things, uh, to help you become more proficient so that you can showcase your designs uh, and really you know, present your, your ideas in a clear and concise manner. And to do that, I think it's important to start with some kind of a base editing ability in Photoshop. And so that's what we're gonna focus on. Um, today, we'll talk about photography in general. How do you take good quality pictures? Because believe it or not, even though you're a designer and you're doing a lot of drawing, sometimes you need to go out and photograph a site. Sometimes you need to go out and photograph an object. Sometimes you need a particular backdrop so you can put something that you're designing into that context. And so we're going to talk about how do you start with good, solid photography to begin with. So um, we'll start with a definition of terms. And these terms just help us get kind of an even playing field. The camera body is basically the light proof box that contains some kind of photosensitive material. Back in the day, that photosensitive material was actual film. Uh, today, it's a sensor that reads light. It's exposed to light when the shutter opens, and that light exposure gives us the photograph. It's the same with our phones, right? Our phones are just a light proof box as well. Aperture is the circular opening in the lens that limits the quantity of light that comes into a particular body at the time, right? So it's how big is the amount of light that's coming in? Is it really tiny? Is it really big, etc. So that matters when it comes to taking a photograph. And I'll explain that right here. The depth of field is the amount of your image that's in final focus. And generally speaking, the larger the aperture, so the more light that gets into the camera at once, the shallower the depth of field would be. So in this example on the right, you can see that the leaf, oops, helps if I pick the right, the leaf right there in front is in focus, but everything back here is kind of blurred out. And that's being done through the aperture of the camera. So here's some examples and why this depth of field might matter. Uh, I have the camera specifics down here at the bottom. Uh, the f-stop is an indicator of the aperture. So that f slash 1.8 is an indicator of how big or small the uh, lens is when it's taking the photograph. An f 1.8 is significantly larger than an f8. So the smaller the number there, the larger the size, which is a little counterintuitive. Um, so anyway. Uh, if we look at the photo on the left here, you can see that just a little bit of these petals there are in focus. And if we go slightly forward or slightly back, it immediately blurs out. That's good for a close-up image. If we wanted to take an image of, say, a landscape where we wanted the whole image to be in focus, we'd want the opposite. So in this case, we want the ice plants in the front here to be in focus, but we also want the rocks back here to be in focus. So we want a large depth of field, in which case a small aperture, a small opening for light is what we're after in the camera. So here's kind of a side-by-side -side comparison. And I think that this is a particularly good one to kind of illustrate the point because it shows us what the lens looks like down here at the bottom. So right there, that's an F16. And you see on this tape measure that it's relatively clear all the way back maybe to there. So we can kind of read what's happening. As this aperture opens, as we get bigger and bigger and bigger, you can see that the depth of field becomes less and less. So that's our depth of field here. When we're wide open here, our depth of field is almost razor thin. So that camera opening, the lens opening, really matters in the end photograph. And understanding that also matters. Shutter speed is the other factor that really determines what the final image looks like. And shutter speed is actually self-explanatory. Um, though in this digital world, there's rarely an actual mirror that lifts out of, the, out of place. On those you know, old SLR cameras, when you actually fire the camera, there's a mirror in there that, that reflects the view into the viewfinder and it actually lifts up 
when um, when you take the picture. And so you can hear that manual click when you take the picture. Now, in in uh, in our terms, it's just a matter of capturing the particular image on our uh, smartphone. So we don't have any mechanical thing that determines how long the light is exposed. It's just digital. So the shutter speed is the amount of time that light is allowed to hit the light sensitive material. In the case of a digital camera, it's the sensor. And that typical exposure is about 125th of a second. So it's really short. And that time starts to matter in terms of what the final photograph looks like. So I'm gonna show you this image. It's shot in the same location each time. And it is shot with a different shutter speed. So in this case, it would be nice if we had one that was even uh, quicker of a shutter speed. This one's at 1 50th of a second. And if we look at it, we could still see some individual drops of water in here that are coming off the waterfall. And we can see a lot of detail down here in the pond, all the little waves, et cetera. As we move forward, one tenth of a second now, you can see that the bulk of those drops, those individual little drops have kind of gone away. And this waterfall is starting to smooth out quite a bit. We still have a fair amount of definition down here at the bottom in the pond in terms of the ripples. Let's go forward to a half second. So it's getting smoother. So you can see that these are starting to become just streaks. There's no individual droplets at all. And the pond down at the bottom is starting to smooth out because those ripples have moved during the course of this photo. We jump forward again, there's one second. It's getting very, very kind of almost misty blurry. And the pool down at the bottom is almost completely smooth. This is starting to get really blown out out here too because of the length of the exposure. Okay, here's another, this is a little bit better at one, one sixtieth of a second. You can see all that spray is caught and frozen in time. A four second exposure over here, there's no spray and all of the waves have kind of blurred together into this kind of blurry patch at the ocean shore. So knowing what shutter speed does can really help to determine what your final image looks like and being conscious about it matters. ISO is a, kind of a weird holdover from the days when you used to buy film. When you would go buy film to go in a camera, you go pick a particular ISO film speed and it had to do with how sensitive that material was. So you might buy an ISO 100 if you were shooting you know, things in bright settings and you might buy an ISO of 800, really sensitive film for shooting things in darker locations. Digital sensors can basically adjust this ISO value. They can choose how sensitive they are. Some of you ex have experienced these kinds of photos before where you get a lot of noise. So the camera is allowing you to take the photo, but it gets a lot of distortion of color because this ISO is too high. The, the light sensor is just too high and we're not getting good quality results. The better the sensor, the higher you can make that ISO, the more likely it is you can shoot in dark locations without a flash and you can get good results like this one. So it's really dependent on the camera. Here's a comparison of ISO on the same, um, kind of like that last one where we're starting with ISO right here at 100. We get a lot of clear image, very little noise. And by the time we jump up to ISO 3200, there's a lot of pixelation, a lot of noise that's happening because that sensor is just overly sensitive. White balance is another thing that applies only to digital cameras. And it allows you to adjust essentially what is white in a photo and how much blue or how much orange is in that white. So is it a warm white or a soft white or is it neutral? Ideally, it's going to be neutral, but we can adjust that. Most modern cameras today do a really good job of adjusting for light. So we don't have to worry about this so much, um, but you may have experienced this in the past where you take a picture and it looks like you're underwater because everything is too blue where it really shouldn't be. And so those are things to kind of pay attention to uh, if you know that something's wrong. Good news is it's an easy fix in Photoshop. So if you mix it up, um, it's easy afterwards to, to do a little post-processing and, and tweak that color later on, tweak that white balance. Bracketing refers to a, is a term that essentially means deliberately taking a series of photographs that are either underexposed, overexposed, and regularly exposed. So it's always going to be an odd number. 
So three, five, or seven. Let's use three as our example. So a bracketed set of photos would be the camera takes one picture that is what it thinks is the correct exposure. Then it takes another picture that it deliberately says is underexposed. And then it takes another picture that's deliberately overexposed. So one that's deliberately darker and one that's deliberately lighter. And so this advantage here is that we can actually fuse those images together. So I think the easiest way, and I will explain this in another lecture in a lot more detail, the easiest way to kind of explain it is, let's say you're sitting at your computer right now in your office. And in that office, you have like under the desk is kind of shadowed and dark as you look around. And then you look out the window and it's really bright. Maybe you're looking at a bright building across the street or something. It's really bright out of the window. If you imagine trying to expose so that you could see under the desk, everything that you would be outside the window would be way too bright. If you exposed for everything outside the window, the desk would be way too dark under the desk. So by bracketing these photos and combining them together, you can actually get exposure that's correct for outside the window, correct that's you know the top of your desk, and also what's correct underneath your desk. Uh, and when you fuse those together, you get images like this. Some of you may have gone to the beach and you've tried to take pictures of sunsets before, and somehow those sunset pictures never quite look as good as the sunset actually looks. That's a big place to discover this. And that's because your eyes are really good at seeing this high dynamic range. You can see what's in, they adjust really quickly for the shadows. They adjust really quickly for the brights. Well, if we fuse those images together, we can get images that kind of allow us to access all of the dynamic range of what the real life location would be. We'll cover that in a lot more detail going forward, but I'd like to introduce it as a concept now. Aperture and shutter speed have an inverse relationship. If you cut the shutter speed, you have to increase the aperture. And this should actually make intuitive sense, right? If we take the shutter speed down so that it gets faster, there's less light coming through the lens into the camera. If we want the exposure to be the same, we have to open up the lens to get more light into the camera to compensate. So exposure value, this chart, for example, gives us a way of kind of, uh, if we were manually shooting a, a photo here, let's say that we wanted to take a, a picture of a rainbow. We could look at this list. We could say it's a cloudy sky background. Our exposure value should be 14. And if we were learning to, to photograph completely manually, we would use this chart. We come down to 14, there it is. We'd say, what aperture do I wanna pick? I wanna use an aperture of 2.0. I'm gonna come down here my exposure or my shutter speed should be one four thousandth of a second. If I wanted to be up here at an aperture of say 16, right, I'd come down and now I'm at one sixtieth of a second. So we could use this chart to figure out how to shoot purely manually. Truth is, very few times do we actually do this. We're going to allow the camera to take control for us and deal with most of those problems but at least you understand the, the, uh, the idea of it. Exposure compensation, however, is something that we might do. And this is where we're looking at an image. Ideally, let's use a phone, for example. You get your phone out and you're looking at an image and the picture that the phone is gonna take doesn't quite look right. Maybe it needs to be a little bit brighter. Maybe it needs to be a little bit darker. That's where this exposure compensation, that's where you touch the screen on your phone and you drag up or you drag down to deliberately lighten or darken the image. I'm sure you've all tried that before. That's exposure compensation. You're telling the phone or the camera, deliberately make this image lighter, deliberately make it a little bit darker. So here's our exposure compensation images, right? So we're making, by jumping down, we're making the image darker. Right in the center is what the camera thinks is correct. And increasing the exposure going up in this direction is making the overall image a little bit lighter. So you have control over that. Even in your phone, you have control over that. So a couple notes on lighting. And actually, I think this is kind of an interesting one because you don't often think about this. But that is that noon, right, lunchtime, is generally the most even light. 
shadows are going to be relatively small and your colors are going to be most accurate. The sun is highest in the sky. It's got the least distortion as it comes in. So you're going to get really accurate colors. So I think my analogy story, this is a, this is a good one. Um, when I was in, let's see, this was my senior year of undergrad. Uh, so it's like ancient history for you guys. I think you were born at that point, but let's just call it ancient history. Uh, I did a field school down in Peru. And so I was part of a team that did some site documentation on this place called Tambo, Colorado in Peru. And it was basically a very well preserved, it's in the middle of the desert. It's in the lowlands in Peru, not in the highlands that you totally think of like uh, Machu Picchu or Olieta Tambo or something. But um, this Tambo, Colorado is in the desert. It's a bunch of mud dwellings and it has some of the best preserved painting, wall painting uh, on the mud walls of anywhere in Peru. And that's because it's in this desert and it never gets rain, super, super dry. Well, I went there with a team of architects and I went there with a team of um, archeologists. And I think the, the, the difference in how we approach things was quite interesting. So the architecture team, the team I was on, we got excited either to get there early in the morning when we first got to the site or late in the day when the sun was low in the sky. And that's because we got more dramatic shadows. We could see the spaces more. We could see how the, the light coming through the windows was activating the space. And that was an exciting thing for us to photograph. The archaeology team, on the other hand, was really interested in preserving and capturing the colors that were on the walls and being as accurate as they could with those colors. And so they instead kind of were lazy in the morning and right around noon, they got super active because they wanted to be able to capture things when the light was most even. So thinking about what your intended goal is really starts to matter when it comes to time of day and lighting in photography. Oops, come on. There we go. Let's talk some about some mechanics here. Digital image file types. Most common one is the JPEG, stands for Joint Photographic Experts Group. Not that you'll ever need to know that again, uh, but the JPEG is basically the most common type of digital photograph file. It's highly compressed. They tend to strip out uh, extra information to make the file size smaller. Um, once, it, once it is converted to JPEG, you can't go back and get more information out of it. So it is stripping it down. It's making the file sizes smaller, but that also makes it most convenient for using it online, et cetera. Usually to images are compressed about 10 to one with very little noticeable difference in what we're seeing on that particular image. A PNG is kind of the next evolution of a JPEG. Uh, it stands for Portable Networks Graphic. And the key here is that it can, depending on the type of compression used, be lossless. So we're not losing any information. We're not stripping anything away, which is great. It's generally the most common of these lossless compression formats. And the big one is that it supports transparency. So if we're in Photoshop and we delete a background, if we cut out an object and we save it as a PNG file, it will then preserve that cutout and therefore the background will be transparent. So it's really a nice evolution from the JPEG. A TIFF is kind of a, um, it's the big lossless format one. So you're not gonna lose, so if you, if you scan an image and it's in TIFF format, you're never gonna lose any information, but it also means it's a pretty big file. It's becoming less and less common because there are more efficient ways of storing images, um, but it is there as an example here. And the last type I'll talk about uh, is, a, is a raw image file. And these are called the digital negatives. And so depending on if you have a Nikon or if you have a Canon camera, et cetera, and of course I'm talking specifics to real physical cameras here, um, they'll shoot in something called raw. And that raw preserves every piece of information that's captured by the camera sensor, even if it's not displayed in the preview of the image. And it allows for a lot of fine tuning after the fact. So you can work in Photoshop or you can work in Aperture and really make some changes to the image in a format where you're not losing any information. So it's beneficial, but it's also a lot larger than a JPEG file. So RAW is really nice. The other file type in here that I, I don't have a slide for, uh, and that is the HEIC, which some of you have probably noticed on your, if you have an iPhone, you've noticed it. It's a format that Apple's adopted. It's kind of the next evolution. It's a hybrid between, let's say, a RAW and a JPEG, 
where we're preserving a lot of the information, but we're getting a lot of file storage compression out of it. Um, we also can include clips of video in the same file type, or we can include lots of stills together. Um, you, Apple has their live photos where you can push on the image and it shows you the, the, the little bit that was taken before and after the actual image was shot in video format. That's all supported in this HEIC format. Um, so it's just an evolution of formats. A little bit harder to deal with though, because it's not native to something like Photoshop. So here's an example of why RAW matters. So I have an image on the left, and this one is an overexposed. We can see in this white area, the paint, it's overexposed. We're not getting a lot of detail. If I took it into Photoshop and I did some post-processing and I did some correction, I could certainly dark it up, but I can't really get much detail back in this area. If, however, this was a raw file and I had my overexposed, same raw file, and then I did some post-processing here, you can see that I can completely transform what I'm seeing in the post-processing. I can completely adjust that exposure after the fact because the raw file type has saved all that information for me. So these are actually a little bit funny. I left them in because they're, they're, they're such old slides that it's kind of fun to look at them. Uh, so this is an example of a uh, camera sensor. Obviously, it's a lot bigger than what goes in our phones now. But this is that photosensitive material. When it's exposed to an image, it's translated from those red, green, and blue squares. That comes into the digital chip, and then it comes out as a binary set of images and then shows up um, on your computer. These are the ones that are pretty funny. So the, uh, the digital elf, the Canon digital elf, this was such a popular camera about 15 years ago. Um, so we'll just kind of skip through these. And then this is the digital SLR. This is the, the camera that wedding photographers would be using. And it's obviously a lot more sophisticated than our phones, but our phones have come a long way. These are modes that used to be on cameras. My guess is that most of you are going to be shooting in your phone. So it's a matter of understanding what your phone allows you to do. And it does have a lot of specifics that can help. Um, these are, these are, if you had a memory card and you were shooting to that, you'd have to pay attention to it. You know, how much space do you have? How many images are you applying to shoot, et cetera. And you always wanna be shooting in the highest format you can. And this is actually something that's relevant even to our phones. I would encourage you to go into your camera settings on your phone and make sure you are shooting at the highest resolution, whether that is in still format or whether that's you've bumped up your video to be in 4K. Storage is cheap these days. Most of our phones can handle plenty and plenty of space. So, so upping those settings to be shooting video in 4K, just making sure that you're at the top of what uh, your camera's capabilities are is a good idea. So what to carry, right? Some of this stuff is kind of funny. Um, you know, obviously we don't need extra batteries or an extra memory card because we're probably shooting with our phones. And I actually, I've heard it said that the best camera is the one that you always have on you. So generally our phones are our best camera because that's the one we always have on you. But you may have other things, right? You may need other things. Uh, a tripod or something to stand your phone on might be a good idea, right? We also want to think about things like the weather, right? And this should be obvious, but you know, guess what? It rains. So this was in that Peru trip. This, we took a, a hike along the Inca Trail, which was absolutely fantastic. Um, and when we got got up there, it was pouring rain. So that makes it a little more challenging to photograph things uh, or to work with equipment when you have that kind of conditions. So this is then, we're moving into the kind of the key component of the lecture. So we've talked all about the basics of photography. We've gotten through kind of an understanding, a basic fundamental understanding of things. But now I wanna talk in more detail about compositional techniques. And if you take nothing else away from this lecture, this is really the important piece of the puzzle. And it's how do you compose an image when you're going to take it? Now, most of the time we take out our phones and we just snap the picture. We don't think about, well, what should I be doing to make this composition better? So there are some composition techniques that can instantly help us create a better photograph. So the first one here is what I call telling a story. And that is either through the mood of a photograph, it usually has to do with light and how the light is coming into a space, or maybe there are pieces of the photo that cause the viewer to want to walk through the photo mentally, 
So we, we dive into the image and try to see how, how our, what it would be like to be in that particular image. So it might be an image like this. This was in St. Peter's in Rome. And it's really not the best picture. I look back on this. I took this in, uh, what was this, 2003 or something like this. It was a three megapixel digital camera, crazy, right? I could have done a lot better with a lot of the technique here, but the idea that the, the light is streaming in through that window has something to do with capturing the aura of that space. So it's about telling the story of what it was like to be in that space. Maybe it's an image like this. This is in the Swiss Alps in Switzerland. And the thing here is that you, as the viewer of this photo, see this little path and you start to trace it with your eye. And you come along here and you say, wow, that's such a long way. And it keeps going and it keeps going and it keeps going. And that invites you into this photo. So you see that path and you, you instantly kind of weave your way along that photo and you become involved with the photo. So that's part of telling this story. Maybe it's an image like this. Now, the other thing I should mention is that a lot of uh, these images use more than one of these techniques, but I'm isolating them and trying to talk about one specific technique, even though there are other things that fall really nicely. Uh, this is a perfect example of rule of thirds too, for example. So in this case, the path continues along here and then it wraps around that tree. So it draws your eye in along that path toward the tree and then you kind of wrap around that tree and invites you into the photo. These are the Andes Mountains in Peru. And again, it had to do with that cloud layer and the light kind of streaming through down into the mountains. Next style here would be something called symmetry. And this is where a strong symmetry dominates the photograph. But we want at least one, maybe a few. Oops, look at that. Typo. One or a few of the elements should deliberately break that symmetry and thereby become the focal point of the image. So here's an example. Um, this was on the Brooklyn Bridge in New York. It's perfectly symmetrical. I was standing right in the center when I took this photo. You can see that white line, the pedestrian line here. Uh, and everything should be symmetrical, one side to the other. Obviously, the background buildings aren't, but the, the main structure, the main emphasis of this image is. The thing that's different is that all the people are only on the pedestrian side of the bridge. They're not on the biker side of the bridge. And so that activates the image. We see all these people, but they're asymmetrical. They're on half the image, but not the whole image. And that's what starts to make this a strong symmetrical composition. Another example here where we have the strong symmetry right down the middle, the couch is symmetrical, but we've got the pile of discarded debris over on the side. So think about what breaks that symmetry. A radial image. A radial image has a strong focal point at the center of the photograph, and the elements radiate outward from that focal point. This is a good way to set up a group of people if you position them appropriately. And a lot of times, if you look at like family portraits, something like this really kind of works. You have one person in the center and you have the other people around them. So let's look at some examples. So this was an ice cave in Switzerland. Um, and uh, the interesting thing here is there's actually the focal point in the center right here is the tension between those two melted ice pieces. It's not an actual element, it's the lack of element, it's the negative space. And so that tension then causes this radial image to appear. Another example here, we've got a receding point and all the lines of this subway tunnel radiate out from that center focal point. I love this image, right? It's a hot air balloon as it's starting to inflate, but we have a strong focal point here, and then we have everything radiating out from that focal point, and the silhouettes just kind of enhance the whole image. A diagonal. A, di a diagonal composition is where a strong diagonal element captures your attention and directs your eye through that photograph. So it might be something as simple as a, as a ledge or a cliff. Again, this is a short depth of field in kind of a sand setup, and it was on the beach in uh, Sea Ranch. But it might be architectural. You might have uh, some strong diagonals. This is at DVC, right? We have those strong diagonals that are part of this image. I think part of what makes that strong is we've got the, the horizontal versus the diagonal. 
Another example here with the, the train tracks being on a strong diagonal as part of that composition. Overlapping layers. This works well in architectural photography, and it's where you're looking through a window or a wall to another wall, which has another layer behind it. So when you start to set up these layers, they start to be these visual barriers that you as the viewer walk your way through. So let's look at some examples. So this is Tambo, Colorado. This is that site that I was talking about with the, with the wall paintings, right? So we have our first opening, which is the doorway that leads into a room, which then has a niche here, but then another window right there. And we can jump through that window into the, the beyond. So this idea of this layering up of elements. So just for context, this is the rest of the ruin in Tambo, Colorado. And you can see a lot of that preserved wall painting right over here. Another example, so this isn't architectural, but the way that the light plays and the way that the elements in this image are, we create these same layers. So let's number them. We've got this front area that's dark. So we'll call that number one. Then we have the dark band to jump to the light. There's a number two. Next dark, this would be number three, right? Then we have the water's edge. This is number four, followed by the water here. And then we come all the way back to this level, which is number five. Then we've got this level, which is number six. We've got the fog back here at number seven. And finally, we've got the horizon. So all of those layers are a layering up of our image. So all that being said, if you take nothing else away from my lecture at all, today, I'd like you to understand what the rule of thirds is. And this is something that's very, very important. It's the simplest rule to follow, but if you start following it, it will be the easiest one to make good photos all the time. So you always think about this when you're taking a photo. A lot of times your, your camera, certainly your phone, has the ability to divide, oops, hold on, darn it. Sorry, I hit escape. There we go. Let me go back in here. A lot of times your camera has the ability to divide. Let's say this is what you're seeing in your camera. It can actually put little lines in here that divide up this image. Oops, like this and like that. If you could turn those on in your image, all the better because we're gonna use these points as important pieces to line up your images. So let's take some examples. Okay, here's an image of the Statue of Liberty in New York. Let's look at how it follows the rule of thirds. Well, it's about a third of the way over on the page and the ground or the base of it is about a third of the way up. So we found one of these focal points right here and we've aligned the Statue of Liberty on that focal point at the same time that we've kind of aligned the horizon along that one third line. And that ends up making it a much stronger composition than when it's just centered. This is a rainstorm up in Maine, right? Same rules apply here. The bow of the boat is about a third of the way over and the boat and the buoy are lining up about a third of the way down. These are approximates. They don't have to be perfect. Right? I think this one also helps because the other side of the lake is about a third of the way over right there. So that's how we're starting to line up these images. So this is a photograph of somebody tying their shoe, right? Nothing too exciting. However, if we look at how this is set up, right? Oops, come on, there we go. We can see that same rule of thirds. Notice that the top rule is right at eye level and we're being drawn to what's he seeing over here. Likewise, he's sitting back about a third of the way. So we have two thirds on this side and only one third on this side. So he's looking and focusing toward the two thirds direction. So you do have to be conscious when you create this stuff, though, because technically speaking, this image also follows the rule of thirds, right? He's a third of the way over, and his eye line is a third of the way down. But he's facing the wrong way, so we're focusing on this part of the image, which is nothing. We want to be focusing on that part of the image. What's going on over here? So he needs to be over there in the image. So pay attention to how you set these things up. Oops. Right? This one, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, fire helicopter, it's about a third of the way over. I would also argue that this has a very strong diagonal to it, juxtaposed with that strong diagonal. So that also is strong in the composition. 
right? Here's a, here's a coconut close up, still a third of the way over. So we still are invited, even though this whole area over here is blurry, we're still invited to wonder what's happening over here. There's a big question mark. So when it comes to taking pictures of people, this is a huge important one to keep in mind. So in this example, we had hiked to the, we did the Inca Trail and we were about to arrive at the Sun Gate in Peru. And as part of that, we needed to take a picture of, hey, look at where we've come. We're up in these high Andes mountains. It's like, you know, 9,000, 10,000 feet above sea level. Let's take a picture. Well, most people take the picture right there where you have the two people centered and that's it. But by shifting it so that those two people, let me back that up here, so that those two people fall on the one third line, you get all the context of where you hiked from. You get all that extra information out of the image. It's very, very different than just seeing the close up of the two of you having hiked. That was back when I had hair. Another example here, this is in Sea Ranch, just a landscape shot. That cliff edge is about a third of the way over. The bottom curve is about a third of the way. And that top peninsula is about a third of the way. So that rule of thirds is just a really easy way of getting you quick and easy, good results. Um, you know, with those good quality results, you're going to have a better composition and a better photograph to begin with. So think hard about that rule of thirds. So this one, sorry, I should go back here, is framing, where you're using something in front to frame something behind. It works particularly well when you, um, when you are shooting through a window. So this was in Pompeii in Italy. We're looking at the Bay of Naples. Um, we're shooting through the window. So we get the context of the window and then what's beyond. It's not the most exciting image, but it's a good example of framing. There's that circular frame. Patterns and repetition. This is another one that's especially good for detail shots. And that's where you can use this pattern and repetition to kind of create this overall composition, but kind of like the symmetry where you want to have a place where you deliberately break it or where something is amiss or different. And that causes you to have a focal point. So here we've got a series of hotel room balconies. They're all virtually exactly the same, except for the one that has the swimsuit hanging over it. That makes it an interesting photo. Now, if it were me, that swimsuit should be moved over and down so it would be right here, and then it would fall on the rule of thirds. So you get both. You get the repetition, but you'd also get that rule of thirds. That would be a much stronger composition if we move that down to right there. Another example here where we have that colonnade, the repetition of each column after column after column after column, all light fixtures lined up. And then we have the person that's walking through the space, kind of a little bit blurry. That's the part that's activating that image. That's the part that breaks that repetition and pattern. Here's another example here of a snow grate. It's not necessarily particularly exciting, but that repetition of the bars is broken by the way that the snow melts through the gate. All right, so those are a bunch of strategies for how we compose images. What I want you to do today uh, and what you're gonna end up posting, let me switch out of this and I'm gonna go to our, oops, come on. Come on, okay. Doesn't wanna move on, sorry. There we go. Couldn't get out of it. <laughs> Apologize. Uh, let's see here. Let me, where do I have? I had it. There we go. So I'm brought back up on Canvas here and uh, we're gonna go to our exercise 203 and talk about what you're going to be doing today or at least for the rest of this week. Part one here, I want you to look online. You can look at Flickr, you can look at Google Images, you can look at National Geographic, that's another great place. 
And I want you to find an image that's about a thousand pixels in size. I want you to look at that image closely and determine what makes it good, what compositional techniques, notice that it's plural there because it probably involves multiple techniques, has the photographer used. So look back at the ones that I just talked about, telling a story, symmetry, radial, diagonal, overlapping layers, rule of thirds, et cetera. And write me a little bit of an explanation about how you think this, photo, this photographer, what techniques they use to make this image good. Okay, you're writing that brief paragraph, any other factors, depth of field, shutter speed, those kinds of things. So based on the lecture today, talk about what makes this image that you found an exceptional image. I want you to download that image and you're gonna post it to Canvas along with your little paragraph when you turn in this particular assignment. That's the part that you're turning in to me by Sunday at midnight. All right, part two, you're gonna get your camera ready could just be your phone, in which case you don't have much to do other than make sure you're shooting in 4K if it's video. And then part three, and this is important for you to do, not because you're going to post it today or as part of this exercise, but we are going to start using these images uh, on Monday of next, actually Monday's um, a holiday, on Wednesday of next week, we're gonna start using these images. So it's important that you go out and take those images so that you can then use them in your post-processing. It works much better if you're using your own images than if you're using uh, images that you find online. So I want you to go out and I want you to do this. I want you to take five photographs of buildings. You pick the buildings. I want you to take five images of people. It can get a little weird if you're taking pictures of strangers, but take five images of people. Make sure that those people are fully in the picture. So don't chop off their feet or their arms or their heads or anything else. So we want the whole person. We're going to end up using these to do cutouts later on. So you want to make sure you have the whole person. I want five detailed images of textures and patterns. Remember, look for the thing that breaks the texture. Look for the thing that breaks the pattern, the thing that's out of place. Five photographs taken from unexpected angles. And this is to get you out of the, I'm always shooting at eye level. Think about getting down. Think about going high. Where else could you be to take a higher quality image? I want you to take four images that are close-ups of something. You pick what they are, but take four close-up images. If you can, I want you to take one bracketed set of images. I know that this is challenging. Remember, a bracketed set is the main exposure and then one that is deliberately darker and one that is deliberately lighter. If you're doing it on your phone, right? take your phone out, take the image, you know, ideally put it on something, put it on a, a table or something, take the image, drag your finger to deliberately lighten the image, take the image again, drag your finger, deliberately darken the image, take the image again. That would be a bracketed set with your phone. You can't, for this, use the HDR mode on your phone. It's not gonna get you the same results. I want three separate images. If this doesn't work, if you can't get your bracketed set of images to work, that's okay. I will give you samples when we get to that lecture. So you don't have to stress out if it doesn't work. I'd just like you to try. Then I'd like you to take a handheld set of panorama images. I know you all have panorama mode on your phone where you, you know, come up and you push the button and you swing your camera around, right? That's not what I'm asking. What I want you to do is I want you to take four, five, or six images where they overlap. So look at the image and say, okay, there's the tree. I'm gonna take a picture here. Then I move the camera over and I take another picture. There's the tree again. I move the camera over, I take another picture, et cetera. I'm getting a question here. What do you mean by drag your finger? Yes, so when you're looking at you know, your phone and you're trying to take a picture, I don't know if I can show, yeah, it's gonna blur out on me here. Um, when you're trying to take the picture, if you tap and hold on the center and then drag up or down, next to it, you can deliberately lighten or darken. It's not doing it for me right now. There it is, right? Where you can deliberately lighten the image or you can deliberately darken the image. Um, I wish there was a way of showing you this. Hmm. Let me, hold on. I'm gonna turn off the blurred background here and let's see if, see if I can make it work, right? So there's the image, right? How attractive is that? Right, I can focus the image by tapping on the image. 
I'm trying to do this looking through the whole thing. All right, well, it doesn't want to do it. Hold on. Okay, there we go. Okay, so we'll see if I'm going to tap on it. It's going to give me that little yellow box. Maybe. Now, well, it's not going to work to show you. Can't do it backwards and upside down. Anyway, yeah, then the little sun appears and you drag that little sun up and down and that deliberately lightens and darkens the image. So anyway, thanks for bearing with me. I was trying, right? <laughs> All right. So um, we're going to do that. Then we're going to do the overlapping set of images. I want you to take one self-portrait and then I want you to take another 25 or more images that are of your choice. Okay, so just another extra 25 images. You take those images of anything you want. Remember compositional techniques when you're doing this. Okay, you don't need to post these images to Canvas yet. We're going to do that in exercise 104 a little bit later on this semester. Okay, if you'd like a challenge down here at the bottom, uh, you can take 30 images of your mailbox. It's shockingly difficult. You can get to about 20 and then you run out of ideas. So anyway, I think you might find that one fun. It's a challenge. You don't have to do it, but it's there as a challenge. Okay, so we got done a little bit early today, a little bit earlier. That's okay. That happens. I'm going to go ahead and let you guys go. My first check-in group will be today at nine. So I want you guys to come in and uh, meet me back at nine. I'll leave the, the um, Zoom open, but I'm going to take a quick break and then I'll be back at nine and we'll go through, uh, go through the things then. Does anybody have any questions? Nope. All right. Sounds good. Uh, if you guys want to stick around, you're welcome to. Otherwise, you're, you can come back. It's always the same Zoom link. Remember, you do. If you didn't come on Monday, I think I got about 10 people on Monday. Uh, if you didn't come on Monday, I need you to come to one of the sessions today. The session times, again, are 9 to 9.30. Hold on, I'm going to pull them up here. 9.40 to 10.10 and 10.20 uh, to 10.50.